Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. Uh, it's very it's a big privilege for me to be here. I've I've been in Poland once before, but never in Wrocław, and uh, and I've I've been in the city for a few days now. It's a very very nice place, and you have very nice campus and wonderful facilities. Uh, I'm I'm going to try to do two things in my talk. I will try to give you a big picture and also some details. And I don't want you to worry too much about the details. I will try to have on each slide what my main point is, and that's what, and I will be telling you that. Um, but I also want you to see that there are details to back up what I'm saying, and you can always look them up later. Some of the slides I'm told will be available, and, you, and I put my email address here. If you have any questions to follow up on later, I will be happy to correspond with you and, and try to tell you what I know about uh, your interests. You see that I come from the Center for Bioelectrics in, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, in the US. And this talk is about bioelectrics. Bioelectrics is a, is a word that we use to mean the effects of external electric field on biological system. Of course, biology is electrical inside and out from single-celled organisms which have maintained a transmembrane potential and use electrical gradients to generate energy. Uh, all the way to um, multicellular organisms like we are, which have a nervous system that's based on electrical transmission. The kind of electricity that I will be talking about is coming from the outside. It's usually high, higher voltages and energies than we have in our cells. Uh, and mostly what I'll be talking about, because this is where the action is, is membranes, cell membranes. When you're exposed to an electric field, most of the impact of the electric field is on membrane. First, I, I want to give you a little historical context for the study of bioelectrics, and it goes way back. Humans have noticed that electric fields have effects on us for a long time, and even as long ago, more than 2,000 years ago, people were using electricity in medicine. And I will show you in a couple minutes in a current application of electricity in medicine, but. Um, the Greeks and Romans, whether how effective it was or not, thought that if you stepped on an electric fish like this torpedo or put it on your head for a headache, that it would have good effect. And uh, the, this study of this particular fish and other electric fish actually parallels our growing understanding over the centuries of how electricity works inside our bodies. Uh, and what the mechanisms are that organisms use to generate and to sense electricity. Uh, this is just an example of uh, in the 18th century, people were pursuing the use of electricity as a medical treatment. And this here was a report of somebody who was, who was cured of a paralysis by being exposed now not to a fish but to artificially generated electrical uh, electrical shock. One of, one of the leaders of the American Revolution for Independence was Benjamin Franklin, and maybe you know that he was also a one of the founding electrical scientists. And in fact, the whole idea of electricity having a positive and negative charge came from Franklin. It was his idea first, and it caught on and turned out to be correct. Uh, he used electricity besides some of the famous stories you may have heard about. He actually figured out that you could use electricity to treat meat and in a sense cook it and tenderize it. And they, they used to organize banquets where they would cook turkeys with electricity. And they also apparently got uh, a kick out of charging up their wine glasses and getting a little shock when they drank their wine. 
And some even crazier things were, were experimented with in the history of our understanding of electricity and biology, like this electric kiss apparatus. Um, this, but this was part of how we came to the knowledge that we have today that really be, began to be truly scientific with the work of Galvani and Volta. Interestingly, Vol Volta's main contribution to electrical science was the development of what we now call a battery. And he, devi he developed this battery to, in order to mimic the way that electric fish generate electricity. And if you look at the biology, anatomy of an electric fish, you see that it's, it's stacks of voltage generating devices like, like the stacks of, of electrical cells in a battery. So now in the, in the 20th century, really we began to understand uh, more quantitatively and more systematically how electricity works in biology. And in terms of the external effect of electricity on cells and organisms, this data that I'm showing you here is some the first recognition that if you apply an electric field across a cell or across just a cell membrane, when the voltage becomes high enough, the electric the membrane breaks down and becomes conductive. The normal function of a biological membrane is to keep things out of the cell or in the cell. And if you raise the voltage across the membrane enough, you can break down this barrier function. And people thought this was interesting, and it also turned out that we have found ways to use this. You can see that um, the voltage that's needed to cause a membrane to become permeable is actually quite small. Physiologically, the transmembrane voltage in your cells ranges anywhere from a, ten, a few tens of millivolts to, in mitochondria, maybe a couple hundred millivolts. Just a little bit higher, three or four hundred millivolt, will permeabilize the membrane. If you do it carefully, it's reversible. So you can permeabilize a membrane, remove the electric field, the membrane will repair itself, or the cell will repair the membrane, and you can do it over and over. If you do it too strong, too high a voltage, or for too long, you will re irreversibly damage the membrane. And this can be used, actually, as another, in another application in medicine, to ablate tumors or to, to remove tissue. I put up here for context to lead into, the, into my talk that about the time this, these experiments were being done, about a little over 50 years ago, was also the same time that we were figuring out the genetic code, that we were figuring out how DNA is transcribed into RNA into proteins and figuring out how, wh what we now take for granted as modern molecular genetics. We did not know in 1950, it was still a mystery. But so think about how far we've come in those 60 years since then. Unfortunately, in the, the understanding of how electric fields affect membranes and cells, we have not made nearly that much progress. In fact, we remain embarrassingly, for us who work in the field, embarrassingly ignorant. This is our picture of what happens when you put a cell in an electric field. This here is a spherical lymphocyte and a kind of a cartoon, simple model of a cell with a membrane and a cytoplasm inside and the conductive medium outside. When it's exposed to an electric pulse, some regions in the membrane become permeable, which I have marked with a question mark, because even now today we don't know exactly the structure of these regions. We know a little bit, but not a lot. When this happens, material that is normally maintained inside the cell can leak out, and likewise, material outside the cell can leak in. And you see for uh, in red at the bottom, that despite the fact that we've been studying this now well, since the 1960s, we still really don't know very much about the mechanisms 
that underlie this process. And I'll show you a little bit about what we do know. Um, one, of, one of the applications of what we call electroporation, the permeabilizing of membranes with electric field, is to allow normally excluded materials like chemotherapeutic agents for cancer treatment or genetic material, plasmids and DNA for genetic therapy, we can use electroporation to open the cell membrane to allow those materials to get in the cell. And this is, a, this is how it's used in electrochemotherapy. Uh, you probably know that electrochemotherapy is not, not pleasant for many reasons, but one reason is it has many side effects. The agents that kill the cancer cells are also toxic and harmful to normal cells. So anything you can do to reduce the dosage of the chemotherapeutic agent while still maintaining the effectiveness is, is a good thing. And we, we use that in electrochemotherapy by permeabilizing, putting electrodes around the tumor tissue where it's an isolated tumor, permeabilizing the tumor cells so that electro, the drug that we're injecting to treat the cancer can get easily into the tumor cells, but cell, normal cells around it remain intact. And so you can use lower dosages. And this is actually quite an effective treatment. It's, it's in use in many countries in Europe, in many clinics. It hasn't yet uh, been accepted in the U.S., but uh, soon. And, it, and it's a, it's a, it, is, it can be a very powerful therapy. Another uh, important application of growing application of electroporation in medicine involves some of the other things that we do when we open up the cell membrane. We don't just let drugs in that we've added from the outside. Um, there's also, we also disrupt the normal ionic balance that is maintained. A cell has lots of potassium inside and very little in the external medium. Lots of calcium outside very little inside. Uh, when we permeabilize the membrane, we allow these ions to cross the membrane and disrupt the normal balance. And we also let nutrients like ATP leak out. One, one application of electroporation focused on calcium uh, and also the loss of ATP. We call this calcium electroporation. It's, and it is being used in uh, it is in clinical trials now, and uh, it, it kills the cells because calcium is poisonous to a cell. If you get too much calcium in a cell, the cell will die. So when we permeabilize a cell and the calcium from outside, which is normally there, goes in, it can be used to kill the cell. This was, uh, in, has been in clinical trials in Denmark for a, a few years, and actually I think it's now, the, the study is over and it's been reported. I just collect some, collected some of the papers that have been published just about this therapy called calcium electroporation, which Yulita here, among others, has, has participated in some of this research. Okay, this is the... I will come back to this slide later. This is kind of the focus of my talk. This is an, some experiments that we did in my lab to try to understand what happens when you permeabilize a membrane. What materials go into the cell? How do they go into the cell? How long does it take? Um, and we, we learned some very interesting things and we learned that some of the things that we and others in the field of electroporation have thought for a long time and many still think are not right. So what you're seeing here is three different compounds that are normally n not able to cross the membrane, propidium, yopro, and calcine. These are fluorescent dyes, and we, we can use them to see if a cell is permeabilized because it become, these dyes uh, can be seen in the fluorescent microscope and normally they are outside the cell and so when the cells become fluorescent it means we have permeabilized the membrane and what you're watching here over time over two minutes 
is the increase of fluorescence of cells that have been treated, in this case, with one single electric pulse only six nanoseconds long. So in that very, very, very brief exposure, we permeabilized the cell and allowed these normally impermeant molecules to enter. And actually, we, whatever we did to the cell, and we don't really know the completely what we did yet, it lasts for many minutes, not just, not just what we show here, but uh, 10 minutes or longer, just from a six nanosecond event. This, uh, on the right here, is Essen Sozer, who's a researcher in my lab who did these experiments, and she's still there working, trying to understand this. We like to combine in our, in our lab both experiment and theory. I'm going to show you some modeling results, but I'm also going to be talking about experimental results. In biology and all of science, modeling is becoming much more important, especially in biology, but it's very important to keep the model grounded in experiment, because you can make a model do anything. You can, by assigning what different parameters, you can make hydrogen atoms behave like uranium atoms. And so, uh, you have to make sure that your model is behaving like a real system. Okay, this is, uh, the rest of my talk will be organized in this way. I'll be talking about what I've called the standard model of electroporation, the general picture that has been developed since the 1960s about what electroporation is, and with some of the problems with this model and s some specific, a specific problem that we identified that I think we now have clarified and people are beginning to accept and the model is beginning to change. This is a picture, a cartoon again of a cell membrane showing a little bit more that a cell membrane is not a simple, like a balloon uh, ar uh, around a cell. It's a complicated structure with a phospholipid bilayer kind of ar uh, scaffold in which there are many, many proteins uh, with numerous functions. This, in the standard model of electroporation, we th have the picture that when we put an electric field across the structure, pores appear in it. There's some kind of, the simple picture is literally a hole in a membrane like a, this diagram shows. I'd like to call them permeabilizing structures. It's a complicated, long name, but the fact is, we don't, we've never seen one of these pores. They're, all, they're basically impossible to see if they exist. And it may be that when we permeabilize membranes with electric fields or with other methods, most of the permeability and increased conductance of the membrane is not a result of literal openings in the membrane, but rather sections of the membrane through which it's more easy for materials to pass. Okay, th and this is our, back to our simple diagram, this is kind of an electrical engineer's view of what electroporation looks like. We have a cell between two electrodes, and we think of the cell as being some conductive material, which is the interior of the cell, surrounded by a membrane, which is not conductive, and then more conductive material outside. For electrical engineers, this is a capacitor, a spherical, a shell capacitor. And we can analyze it like that, and a lot of the things that happen to a cell in an electric field do follow this analysis. It's, so it, it's a useful analysis, it, but it doesn't go far enough. You can see the equation above the cell there on the left that define how the transmembrane voltage increases when we put a field across the cell. The charged particles inside the cell and outside the cell move in the electric field. They cannot cross the membrane at first, and so voltage builds up. When that voltage gets high enough, the membrane is permeabilized, and then you see material going in and out of the cell that normally cannot. This is a, another picture of the same model, kind of summarizing what, what we know about this. Um, as I said earlier, the membrane, because of some basic physics, we don't have time to go into it right now, but 
just because of the basic physics of the situation, the membrane of the cell is going to be the structure that feels the field. That's where the energy of the field is deposited. Um, the larger the field and the larger the cell, the larger the voltage will be across the membrane. Um, mo and, the, and it's polarized, so it, if the field in this diagram goes across from left to right, the cell will be polarized at those ends of the cell and not at the other part of the cell. Uh, when the field is in, is in reaches a high enough level, the membrane will be permeabilized. And that, that is the s basics of the standard model of electroporation. Now, people who have worked on this for years now, of course, have developed a whole system of equations beyond this simple charging expression to describe how the pores form, what is their energy, and so forth. Um, but but this, it's all based on this simple idea. And again, I note, it, I, I note and call to your attention that our, the normal state of our membranes in our cells is close to the point at which the membrane becomes permeabilized. So the membranes are very close to a critical point, uh, and you just raise the voltage a little bit and you permeabilize it. Okay, we use, uh, in my lab, we use molecular modeling to try to understand what happens to the membrane when we apply the high voltage across it, uh, high voltage being a few hundred millivolts. And we, we use a tool called molecular dynamics. I don't have time to explain all the background of it here, but basically we represent every atom in the system with a charge and a mass, just like real atoms, and we allow them to interact through Newton's law and Coulomb's law we don't have any chemical reactions in this kind of modeling, but we, any mechanical or physical changes can be represented. And what you are seeing in this slide is what happens to a little tiny piece of a cell membrane, just a few nanometers, about seven nanometers across in the horizontal direction, and a, l a little more than that in the vertical. So just a little piece of cell membrane because we can't, it takes a lot of computer time just to do this. Uh, and we're not showing the interior of the membrane so that you can see what happened, but in a real cell membrane, the interior, w the white space here, is filled with hydrocarbon of the phospholipid. At the top of each one of these panels is water, which you could think of as outside or inside the, the cell. And then along the, the interface, in the, uh, facing the blank region interior of the membrane are the head groups of the phospholipids that make up the membrane. And what we see is the most important thing that happens involves water. When we apply the electric field, it stabilizes the formation of water intrusion into the membrane, and we see within a few nanoseconds of applying the field, we see it bridges across the membrane. The phospholipids of the membrane follow the bridges and we get a pore. This happens in any individual case randomly. So from the time you apply the field until you see the pore can be 100 nanoseconds or 2 nanoseconds, depending on the magnitude of the field, but it's random. A higher field makes it appear faster. Once the pore starts to form, it's very rapid, one or two nanosecond. So this makes us believe that in that six nanosecond pulse experiment that I showed you, probably we are forming structures like this. Now, when we, in the bottom row of, of uh, panels, you can see what happens when the field is removed. And it's kind of like running in reverse within a few tens of nanoseconds the field, the pore withdraws, the field is, re the membrane is reorganized, and you're back to a normal membrane. We know this doesn't happen in a cell, so there's got to be more to the picture than this. This is just the beginning of it, but it's something that's useful to study, and we have learned a lot from this kind of tool. And I will just show you a movie of how this happened. 
you can see uh, now you can see the lipid tails on the inside of the membrane and uh, as time goes on and the total time here is about five nanoseconds you will see the water intruding into the interior of the membrane the head group atoms the red spheres and the gold and blue spheres of the head groups are following it eventually the water finds its way across you get a bridge and a pore form this is just a few nanosecond event and it's just a small little piece of membrane this probably happens across a very wide area of the cell in this kind of, of uh, exposure okay now some problems with the standard model one of the things the standard model of electroporation predicts is that the larger the cell the easier it is to porate it because the larger the cell the larger the transmembrane potential will be induced by the external field so you expect it will porate faster uh, and that that's a part of the fundamental equations of the standard model as I've shown here the problem is if you look in the experimental literature where people have investigated this and actually this hasn't been looked at very carefully these are all the papers I could find since 1968 where people looked at the effect of cell size on how easy it was to electroporate the cell and you can see about the same number of papers said larger cells are easier to make permeable and the, or no it doesn't larger cells are not easier um, so that raises a big question about is this model is there something really flawed about what the model is claiming to represent so this is an example of some a paper that said yeah larger cells are easier to permeabilize here's one that said uh, larger cells are more difficult to permeabilize and here's a paper where they said it doesn't matter uh, so there is a lot of variation here that the simple picture that a lot of us have and operate on just not adequate to describe another another pro thing that the standard model doesn't describe is how long do these pores last once we permeabilize a cell how long does it take after the electric field is gone to be fixed to be repaired and the, again the the standard model says very little about this and has nothing about how there could be any variation but the fact is in the literature we find that cells under some conditions can be permeabilized for many minutes even basically indefinitely if they're kept cold or the poor lifetime can be just microseconds or microseconds or even uh, even shorter than that in some cases in this case uh, a few milliseconds two different kinds of experiments two different kinds of endpoints but indications that whatever is going on when we permeabilize membrane for the electric field is not simply the simple model of a balloon that we're making holes in and having things leak through the pores uh, this is some data from lipid vesicles not cells but just artificial membranes made only of lipids which had, tend to have very short lifetime cells tend to have very long permeabilization lifetime telling us there's something about the complexity of the cell membrane that's making the permeabilized state last longer and that just thinking of membrane as phospholipid bilayer is not going to be adequate here's another example of what we completely don't understand about electroporation you can see three cells in this slide and in the medium around them is the dye called propidium which I mentioned earlier propidium is not fluorescent by itself and it can't go through the membrane by itself if it gets into the cell it can bind to nucleic acid primarily DNA and it becomes quite fluorescent and that's how we detect permeabilization and what what this slide is showing you is after an initial exposure uh, shortly after the beginning of this time sequence 
there is a very low level of propidium going into the cell, and you can detect a small, small increase over time. Then suddenly, after a long time, 13 minutes, one of the cells becomes much more permeable, and suddenly a bunch of propidium goes in. Not, not any big apparent change in the morphology of the cell, but suddenly the membrane becomes very permeable. And then later, many minutes, more minutes later, the second cell. We have absolutely no explanation for this. Another, another thing we can't explain very well is the entry of different kinds of materials through an electroporated cell membrane. Here we have propidium at the top, plasmid DNA. It's a, commonly, a common application of electroporation is to allow plasmid DNA to enter the cell for genetic engineering. Uh, and also siRNA. The patterns of entry and the kinetics of entry of these three kinds of materials into the cell is completely different and completely undescribed by our standard model. Okay, now our measurements that I, that I mentioned near the beginning of the talk raise another question. We, this is S and Sozer again, and this is a di diagram of the apparatus that we use. You can see we have on our microscope, we have chambers containing cells with different dyes that we use to monitor the effect of the electric field that's caused by putting electrodes down into the chamber around the cells. You can see them here on the bottom panels, the dark shapes on the sides are the electrodes. And in this case, we are watching Yopro, another impermeant fluorescent dye, go into the cells over time. And that was that, the data that I showed you earlier, and we'll come back to it. You can see them becoming more and more fluorescent, and this goes on for many minutes after that single six nanosecond pulse that you can see there. So this is what the data looks like um, for... Uh, S several different experiments that we did for the repetition of the same experiment. You can see that we, we are, I'm not describing how we did it, but we can actually know quantitatively how many molecules are going into each of these cells, how many molecules per second or whatever. And we, you can see it at the beginning, after the initial exposure, there is a fast rate of influx, 180 of these Yopro molecules per second per cell, it doesn't sound like very many, and it's not, but we can detect it. And then the rate slows down, and it continues for, in a kind of a linear rate for a long time. And we've never, we've never watched long enough to see when it actually stops, but it stops at some point. Because these cells can recover, they're not dead. Uh, they have repaired their membrane um, largely, they've recovered their osmotic balance, but they're still permeable to this dye. So we, the model has no explanation for how permeabilization can last for 10 minutes. But there's another problem with the model that this experiment led us to. We started thinking about how does this dye work? And here's a lesson for any scientist. You really always want to know your tool. Don't just use a kit. Don't just read what somebody told, a procedure somebody told you. You need to know exactly what is going on in that procedure. So we were thinking about how does Yopro or Propidium tell us about permeabilization, and I told you earlier, first you have to permeabilize the membrane, then the dye has to get into the cell, find some nucleic acid, some helical nucleic acid, it intercalates into the helical structure, and then it becomes fluorescent. So we wanted to know, okay, that's interesting, but we're just interested in getting across the membrane, that part. So we need a dye that doesn't go into the cell, find some substrate or some, something to bind to. We need something we can just detect directly. Um, this is the way propidium works. It, uh, that's a propidium molecule or a parent molecule, propidium intercalates into DNA double helix and it become, then becomes fluorescent. It turns out, however, that propidium doesn't only become fluorescent when it binds to DNA. 
it becomes fluorescent when it binds to cell membrane, for example. And I didn't know this until recently, but propidium is actually a drug that binds to the acetylcholine esterase receptor and to acetylcholine esterase enzyme itself. And it has an application in therapy for Alzheimer's. Because if you bind to this site uh, called the peripheral anionic binding site of acetylcholine esterase, it has a positive effect on the development of amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's. You can't use propidium literally as a drug for people because it's very toxic. But to my surprise, propidium is the standard against in drug development for this disease. Propidium is the standard against which new drugs are measured. So propidium is like 1.0. And if you can get a drug that works as good as or better than propidium, uh, then the, the, com the drug company you're working for will maybe give you a bonus and may, they might try out that drug. Anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a completely parallel life of propidium, which some of us use a lot. Uh, for one purpose, it turns out it has completely other purposes. Uh, and it's important to know that when you put propidium into your cell suspension, you may be having other effects on the cells besides just this fluorescence that develops when the propidium gets inside. Uh, so we, we look for a small molecule, fluorescent molecule, that's fluorescent all by itself, natively fluorescent, that's impermeant, uh, and that we could use as to track directly permeabilization of the membrane. And we found the candidate, calcine. Not calcium, calcine. It's a small, small molecule on the lower right. It actually, people have used this in the past as a marker for electroporation, as an indicator. Uh, and so we thought we would try it. And we did try it, and we couldn't make it work. We did an experiment, we pulsed the cells, calcine did not go in. Even under conditions where Yopro and Propidium or other dyes easily went into the cell. So we thought something was wrong with the reagent, we're not following the... Then we went back and read the literature where people used this dye before, and we found out that the concentrations that they were using were a hundred times or more higher than the concentrations we are used to using for our standard Yopro propidium experiment. Uh, people just reported this in their methods, and we hadn't noticed carefully that they weren't hiding it. But for some reason, they had to use really like hun milli hundreds of millimolar concentration. So we tried that. We increased the concentration. And we could get some calcine in. This is a picture. This is data from some of our experiments showing, OK, pretty good influx of propidium and Yopro, these other dyes. So we finally got some calcine in, but still a lot less, even though the concentration is much higher. Uh, actually, in this diet, this is normalized for concentration. So um, the other thing that I'll, if you didn't notice already on the slide, I'll tell you now is that there's another difference between propidium and Yopro and this molecule calcine, and that's the charge. Propidium is a positively charged molecule, and so is Yopro. Calcine is a negatively charged. And we started to wonder if, there was, if, it was, if we were missing something that had to do with charge. Now, if we're just making holes in the membrane and molecules are diffusing through it, charge should not matter uh, because the electric field is gone. During, while the field's there, yeah, but most of the influx in these experiments is happening way, way after the application of the electric pole. So we get began to wonder, uh, sorry, we began to wonder what would happen if we put calcine into the cell and permeabilized it, would it come out? Because you, as you may know, the, in, the transmembrane potential of an 
healthy cell is negative on the inside. So we were starting to think positive dyes can e easily go across that membrane barrier if it's permeabilized driven by the positive to negative potential. But a negative molecule will be fighting the electrical potential to get into the cell. And maybe that's why calcine and some of its cousins do not easily go in, even permeable cell. So let's put it inside the cell and see if it comes out. And it comes out of the cell just as easily as these positive dyes go in. Okay. Now we come to a really basic misconception that ha people who have followed the standard model and preached the standard model for many years, including me, have been guilty of. Normally we have membrane, as I said, has a potential across it, a few tens of millivolts or maybe more. Um, and it's negative to the inside. When you raise the potential high enough, you make pores, as you have seen. What I call the dogma of the passive membrane, which has been maintained now for many years, is that once the membrane is permeabilized, once you have these holes in it, it becomes very electrically conductive. So the, there must be very low or zero voltage across it. In fact, it's of such a low voltage, we can just ignore it because the membrane is permeabilized. And as long as the membrane remains permeabilized, the transmembrane voltage is zero. Well, Ohm's law, as you know, has three parts, voltage and, con and conductance or resistance, but also current. If you have enough current through a permeabilized membrane, you can still have a vo any voltage that you want. You just adjust the current. And we think cells are recovering very quickly after permeabilization and the resting potential that's normally there is restored. So we see this bias against our negative dye going into the cell. The models originally, and here's from a 1992 paper about the standard model, originally allowed for this transmembrane potential after the pores were formed, but it was forgotten. And I won't go through all these examples, but all of the people that I learned electroporation from said things like molecular transport is dominated by diffusion, uh, fixed part of the Nernst-Planck equation is, is, uh, is uh, the only part that matters, only diffusion happened. This was uh, Eberhard Neumann, who was born here in Wroclaw. He's one of the founders of the field of electroporation. He actually, he did maintain this and only recently he's realized this was not correct. So uh, several other examples here, uh, including I was a co-author of one of these, um, saying that the field or the potential after the membrane permeabilizes is zero. Well, this is a lesson for uh, all of us scientists, even experienced ones, you can get caught in an assumption. You can think you're very careful and you challenge everything, but you can get caught in an assumption. And we, none of us question this. None of us quest, who try to model electroporation question this. So that was wrong. You should always be questioning everything. Um, it was bad because it's a wrong assumption. You should question your assumptions whether they're right or wrong. But it's also bad because it makes a difference and it, we couldn't explain this experiment without violating this assumption. Very few people have actually tried to measure the transmember potential. You would think that that would be done, but it's not so easy. But in the few older experiments like this one, that actually people did demonstrate that transmember potential was recovered, in this case, but not for one and a half minutes. They didn't have any data before that. Recently, I convinced the same author to use a new method, and now we can see that transmembrane potential is in fact recovered in seconds, or less than seconds, it starts coming back. So it's consistent now with our experiment. If we add 
to our calculation of transport, not only the diffusion that occurs through the permeabilized membrane, but also the voltage-driven electrophoretic component of the transport, we can match our calcine data. If we have, and that's the, the colored data, the dashed lines indicate the transport we would expect without any transmembrane potential. So we can fit the transport very well, actually with a fairly small value, but it's not zero. Okay. Um, I hope I've showed you that we know a little bit about electroporation, and we have tools for studying it, but it's like almost everything else, it's not that simple. And one of the things we have to balance in science is how much of the complexity can we handle? We usually we know, we're aware that we are simplifying things. We're just reducing the number of variables just so that we can handle it in our minds or so that our analytical tools can work. But there's, as Einstein said, it's, things should be kept as simple as possible, but not simpler. And in the case of electroporation and maybe th other things that you are studying, things are, have been kept too simple. And it's time to go beyond that. And I, I have given a name to this, the system that you have after you perme electropermeabilize tissue. I call it the electropermiome. And you know there's a lot of ohms in biology these days. And I, I think it's an important concept to help you real think and gather and organize the complexity that you know is there. The electropermiome is a term I use for all of the things in a cell that are affected by that electric pulse. So the, the old picture was this. We're some, we have a, some kind of spherical shell structure and we're making holes in it somehow with the electric field and things then can pass in and out through that shell. Um, this guy, uh, Just Antissier, some of you may know, a few of you know him, has been telling us for many years, you're not just making holes in the membrane, you're doing more than that when you permeabilize a cell. And I'm thinking now our picture should be more like this. We should be thinking when we pulse cells with electric field, or when we stress them other ways in different kinds of experiments. We, we have a system that is dynamic, and it's alive, and it fights back. It, there is a response, and part of what we're seeing in these long-term two-minute, ten-minute impermeabilized cells is the cell is the cell fighting back and repairing and restoring itself. This is a, another part of the cell I didn't mention earlier that I think is important in this process. In addition to the phospholipids and the mem and the proteins in the membrane, we have also a structure anchoring the cell on the inside, cytoskeleton and other structures like that. And there are extracellular st structures in different kinds of cells that lend mechanical integrity to the membrane. We probably are disrupting these also when we deliver these electric pulses. This is a, um, one, a new drawing I've been making of all the things that might be affected by electropermeabilizing exposures. Um, of course, there are more than this, and we can't study all these uh, together, but m we need, those of us in the field, have the challenge of beginning to look more carefully at all these other things besides making holes that we are doing. Okay, uh, if you want to learn more about this, if you find this an interesting subject, I went very fast over a lot of things. And I, I hope I didn't completely use you. You have my email address, or you can talk to me, of course, during the day. But I wanted to point out some meetings that are coming up that you might be able to find a way to attend where this will be, uh, the electroporation topics like this will be part of the meeting. Um, one of them is called BioEM, Bioelectromagnetics 2018. This is a meeting in Slovenia in June. It's, uh, it'll be 
a few hundred people there talking about topics like this. In our center in Norfolk, Virginia, in the U.S., we have a week-long workshop on, on bioelectrics, broader than electroporation, that's part of it, but on the more general topic of bioelectrics. Uh, that, that's in July. Uh, there's a schedule uh, in Prague in September is another bioelectrics meeting. This will be a conference with talks like this one and posters and so forth. Uh, and finally, in Ljubljana in November every year, there is a school or a week-long workshop, again, devoted mostly to electroporation and uh, a little bit and to the applications of electroporation, so you get both the theory and some applications. It's a week long, and during this workshop you have, you have also laboratory activities, so you, 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 can, you get experience with some of the uh, generating data like I showed you and other kinds of techniques. Uh, those, are, those are people who will be lecturing this year. Uh, we have special lectures each year. And uh, th those are always very up to date and interesting. And this this is the core content of that course. Uh, of course, none of us learn things all by ourselves or discover things all by ourselves. And these are some of the people that I am very lucky to work with, and who have given me uh, the ideas that I've tried to present to you here today. I'm very grateful to them and grateful for your attention. Thank you. And I'm sorry that it's a little after 11. Lecture, and uh, we have uh, time for one or two, uh, two questions, short questions. Maybe comments, please. Okay. One, two, yes, okay. <laughs> uh, I have a question, I hope it's proper. Um, because currently we are using the electrostain physiotherapy. Uh, probably um, all of us know some of that. Um, uh, and I'm very curious because uh, these studies are still conducted and the safety of electricity impact on the cell is still unknown till the end. So uh, I was uh, wondering, um, do you think as an expert, uh, is it safe uh, for now to use it in the mm, like a treatment, for example, uh, to make the drugs going into the cells, like um, for example, um, in anti-inflammatory drugs, um, whereas we don't know the effects, um, for example, in few years after that treatment, um, because when the cell is um, treated with the electricity, sometimes we don't know the effect um, after a few years, or maybe it's uh, that re reversible, that it's safe. I'm, I was wondering about that. There, there is a long history of the use in the clinic of electrochemotherapy, and it's been used in, in humans now for many years, also in animals. There is no, absolutely no indication that I'm aware of that there's any long-term or even short-term effect of the electric field other than the effect on the membrane. If you, of course, if the dose is too strong, you can, you'll have physical damage, burning, heating, but if the application is carried out correctly, you don't have any heating, so you don't have that kind of side effect. Long-term, there's no indication of any any effects other than the permeabilization of the membrane, which is restored very quickly. Okay, thank you very much. Any question, comment? Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. Uh, I was wondering if you observed in your experiments uh, the difference in the pore size when you applied different uh, 
pulse duration, for example, 10 nanoseconds and uh, 100 microseconds. The question was about pore size, and I, I, we could have a whole talk or series of talks on pore size and how do you measure it and estimate it. Um, in general, the lo if we believe our molecular simulation, just for a lipid bilayer, the longer you leave the electric field there, the larger the pores will get. In fact, we have learned how to control. Once we make the pore like I showed you, we can by adjusting the magnitude of the field, we can make the pore stay at any size, um, uh, up, to, up to a physical limit. But they can get very large, or they can be down to a radius of about 0.4 nanometer. Just big enough to let these molecules through, by the way. Whether by coincidence or not, that, that minimum radius, is that's the the physical property of the phospholipid, the, if, it, if they get any smaller than that, it's not stable and the pore goes away. So, uh, A, we don't know the size of the pores that we're making in any case. We ha I had some slides, but I have time for them. Showing you how using a di the diffusion model and blocking diffusion or blocking transport with the larger molecules, we can come up with estimates on the size of the pores that are consistent with what we see in our molecular models. But to know the actual population of pores that is formed, especially in cells, and how that population evolves over time, both in number of pores and size of the pores, is a huge, huge black box that we just don't know. Thank you. Thank you.